Okay, so talking about chapter seven in language. So you notice that where we're going in the book overall, um, we're looking at mistakes in reasoning, fallacies, uh, where we kind of jump to conclusions, things like that. Uh, language is an important aspect of this, right? So we're gonna start looking at the meaning of words, the semantics and the syntax, how you put these words together. And this is gonna be really important. Oh no, oh, okay there, got stuck. So language, uh, like I was saying right now, is this tool that we're using to formulate arguments. And this is partly uh, what this class is about, right? Uh, using logic uh, and composition, trying to formulate your ideas. And that's definitely what you'll do later in the class as well for the midterm and the final, is that you're going to start formulating your own arguments about issues. Now, of course, you can use language to do that. And in order to effectively do that, uh, you want to avoid, right, those fallacious arguments that uh, we had talked about before. You want to argue in a, in a very honest, straightforward, logical way, rather than using those tricks or manipulation or things like that. And in order to kind of avoid those issues, you, you have to kind of keep in mind, well, how can you fall into those issues, right? So you don't know how to avoid a trap if you don't know how the trap works, right? So this is where we're talking about cognitive meaning and emotive meaning. And this is where uh, we get into semantics. Semantics uh, discusses the meaning of words, uh, what is the underlying concept to the word. So with cognitive meaning, these words are pretty, I guess we want to say straightforward in the sense that they're supposed to represent or mean in a very one-to-one -one relationship. And what I mean, again, this is kind of ironic, but what I mean by that is that if I say that the my phone is, I don't know, um, five by three inches, you know, that's a very straightforward meaning of, okay, this is the phone and has these properties. Uh, this is the size of it. You know, it doesn't seem like I'm uh, implying anything more than just the size of the phone. Now, a mode of meaning on the other hand, that's where we have some uh, overtones of, uh, well, that it can actually be, actually be loaded in some way where it means more than just the words I'm saying, that there is an underlying meaning to it. And then you can have neutral force tones where it, it doesn't seem to go either way. So what would be some examples of that? Uh, in the book, they talked about racial slurs as some examples where it's a word, but clearly a, these, these racial slurs these examples they gave have an emotive meaning as well. They, they're, they're, there is an underlining uh, sort of emotion uh, that's going on there. Maybe a level of disrespect, of um, injustice, things like that that are also carried in within the meaning of the word. So um, I've been watching this uh, show on HBO and it's about the 1940s and about segregation. And the term boy is actually a really uh, good example of an emotive meaning term. So boy sounds like it's a cognitive meaning, we're speaking a young man. But in, in some situations, boy can be used or is used to refer to an adult man but in a sort of derogatory way and especially towards African Americans and other minorities that a boy doesn't deserve the same respect so calling a grown man a boy is your kind of you could see that emotive meaning to it 
uh, that they're implying something more than just a young man. So when we talk about these type of emotive forces where emotion, like words do carry some emotion sometimes, uh, they can be given in institutions as well. This is, uh, it's not just a one-to-one -one argument or something like that between people. Uh, the example from the book that I wanted to use here was a term uh, comfort women. And what they meant by comfort women are women of a conquered country forced to work as prostitutes serving soldiers. And this term was used in Japan uh, during World War II. So this I, what's really going on, if we're going back to the, the cognitive element to it, just like trying to report the facts, is that these women are forced into prostitution. But you see, uh, in order to make it sound not as bad as a the reality, they to use the term comfort women uh, for these soldiers. They're supposed to make these soldiers, uh, they're supposed to comfort the soldiers when really uh, it's not consensual and, and these women are being forced into this situation. So you see how not just individuals, but uh, governments, uh, large policies, institutions, whole groups of people can use these terms, these words to manipulate it in such a way so that it doesn't sound as bad as the reality of it. Uh, especially in diplomacy, you can see this a lot as well, where uh, professional diplomats, or you're trying to just be diplomatic with friends, or just trying to, you know, get friends to get along, you might put it in a way, or you might explain it in such a way as to try not to offend anybody, uh, so that, you know, uh, that social element of getting along will work. Uh, I don't know if you can see, it's kind of small, really. Um, I wanted to blow this up a lot larger. Uh, socialism is actually really interesting. Uh, the term socialism is being thrown around a lot politically right now. Uh, in the last couple of years, you know, people accuse other people of being a socialist, and um, you know, some people will identify as a socialist. But no, but what I find interesting is that very few people take the time to actually define what they mean by socialist instead of just using the word or calling somebody a socialist. Uh, there was a poll uh, that was taken some years ago and they were asking um, American people, what uh, is their understanding of the term uh, of socialism? And they were looking at people who identified as Democrats and Republicans in the United States. And what they found is their percentages wise, uh, the different views of what they meant, what they, I guess attributed socialism to a party, what that meant. And really, if you look at the that term, the history of the term, and I brought up Webster's Dictionary as an example here, there's many different definitions to the term socialist. And I think this is where a lot of the confusion happens, that you have different definitions for the same word. So you have different meanings. So the first one is that any of the various economic and political theories advocating collective or governmental ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution of goods. It's a very dry sort of definition, uh, but you see that there's a lot to it. How people will take that emotively, what they'll attribute to that, that definition saying about their lives is gonna be very different. A second definition is a, a system of society or, or group living in which there is no private property, but everything is shared, right? A system or condition of uh, society in which the means of protection are owned and controlled by the state. The state meaning any sort of government or uh, institution. So how things are produced, who owns that, um, those products, things like that would be determined by the country. And the third one I think is most interesting for us as philosophers uh, is going back to the philosophers who, who started developing these, con these concepts. 
So Marx and Engel are two very famous philosophers and they're usually associated with communism. And they wrote this book called the Communist Manifesto. But what I find is a lot of people haven't bothered to read the Communist Manifesto. As a philosophy major, of course, uh, usually we're required to read it. And what they were talking about is a stage of society in which they thought it's more of a descriptive thing than it is a prescriptive thing. And what I mean again by that is that they're describing what they think is gonna happen, not telling people this is what should happen. In some sense, and this is where it gets vague and we're gonna talk about vagueness right now. What they thought socialism, socialism was is this transition period from a society that depends a lot on capital, on things that are owned by everybody. So I own this phone, I own this computer. You know, these are properties. These objects are something that I can own. And then talking, then transitioning from that, they said they thought that in time, we would go to a socialist where the government the state is going to have communal property. We're all going to contribute. And then it means we're all kind of own this thing. So very easy case or uh, example would be like a potluck or something where everybody brings food and everybody shares the food. So no one person owns the food. We all kind of contribute. And that means that even if you didn't bring the beer, you didn't bring the chips, but you brought something to contribute, that you can share in those uh, products, right? And then essentially later, you're going. They thought that society was going to move to some sort of communalism, where we'll all kind of work together in that sort of way. So that's what they meant by socialism. That there was going to be some sort of a transition period between these types of living. But the way we use it politically now is sometimes used as a, an offense or as, as, as a put down or something, right? So emotive means have an element of persuasiveness that you're trying to kind of persuade somebody to, to lean one way or the other and to think in a certain way. Uh, negative terms like, uh, bureaucracies, uh, academies. These sound like weird words. They are a bit made up. They, well, all words are made up in some sense, but what these words have that they're implying emotive is that it's some way, it's somehow in a negative connotation. It's, it's not a good thing to speak speak with jargon. And jargon is a really important word here. And I'm going to focus on that. Jargon is usually referred to terms or words that have very particular context and meaning that certain experts in that area use. So as a philosopher, we have a lot of jargon. There's a lot of uh, special words that uh, we use that identify certain things that probably most people wouldn't use those words. Uh, epistemology is the example that pops in my head right now. Uh, I remember when I first started learning philosophy, uh, taking courses, all these new words, I thought it's like, wow, what a waste of time, or why are they making it more confusing than it really has to be? Uh, but then I, uh, after some time though, I started realizing that I started using the jargon as well because it just made it more efficient to talk to other philosophers. That if I would use the term epistemology, which means the study of knowledge, it kind of was a lot easier to say epistemology or epistemological something rather than every time saying the study of knowledge, the study of knowledge. That, that didn't seem to like be really effective. And engineers, scientists all have jargon, right? You work in a particular area. Even in jobs, uh, I can think of like, I used to also work at restaurants. They would have like funny short names for 
uh, food, right, plates. They would call it certain things that that's not what it was called in the menu, but that the cooks in the back, we knew what that meant. But there's an element of where people get, um, I guess, uh, put off by this type of jargon that say, well, you guys are speaking another language. I don't understand what you're saying. And that might be connotated as a bad thing that you're making it more complicated than it is. In some cases, that accusation can be true. But in other cases, they're, they're also very politically too, and this is why we'll talk about politics right now, that politically this these type of uh, words can be used to, to, I guess, discourage people from certain things um, and trying to understand something. And we're gonna get to some examples I think right now. And so these type of manipulative words where you can say things in a certain way to make them sound nicer, make them sound actually maybe worse than they are, uh, they're used a lot of the example here, uh, grabbing from the book, the military, when they say they deploy troops, uh, that's a lot nicer than saying they're in, you know, that they send troops to invade some place or something like that, a country or an area or territory. Uh, deploying troops doesn't have the same negative connotation. Um, euphemistic language. So, that's where you're using some words to kind of maybe, yeah, like I was saying, finesse it, make it sound better, make it sound a lot nicer than this. Uh, the example in the book was outplacement office, which is really the place where they're going to uh, fire people. <laughs> Instead of saying fire people or get rid of people in a business, it's an outplacement office. Uh, there was an example grave uh, that I liked in the book where it kind of compares a lot of, you can see this comparison, they, they again um, try to uh, get some feedback. Uh, this is by the US News and World Report. So when uh, politically, when certain parties refer to certain concepts, the politicians talk about something, they'll use certain words uh, to convey that. So Republican, they found out would say climate change. Uh, Democrat would say more likely say global warming, uh, faith-based uh, instead of religious, uh, school vouchers, school choice. So you can kind of see that um, both sides are kind of manipulating the language so that uh, what ever follows their beliefs, they're going to make it sound better or worse. There's there's that emotive element to it where where you're where if you don't like something, you're gonna make it sound bad. If you but if you are for something, you support something, you're gonna try to make it not sound as bad. Uh, you can see this in class differences as well. I thought this is interesting. Uh, the book refers to compensation versus salary. So if I say oh, I, I make a salary, I earn a salary, certain uh, people of uh, wealthy classes will not refer to their income that way. They're not gonna say, oh, even income. They wouldn't say I earn an income or I earn a salary. They, they would say maybe I, I uh, acquire compensation. Uh, education, you can see this. Uh, another example from the book that was interesting is a student success workshop, which sounds good, right? It sounds like it's a positive thing. Uh, but the book refers to that sometimes, you know, this term student success workshop was, was used to identify students who, who were in a remedial course that they had to take uh, really beginner classes or something like that, and they weren't uh, on the same level as their peers, right? So it's a lower class uh, that they had to take before they took something else, like a prerequisite. Uh, but calling it student success workshop sounds a lot better than um, a remedial class. 
And the book also identifies too that euphemisms have increased. We've, as our language, I think, also develops and uh, we use uh, communication more, the way we say things uh, is a little bit more complicated or a little bit more nuanced. Like uh, the term that I'm using from the book again is putting to sleep. That sounds a lot nicer, right? Than they're going to um, um, execute my dog or something like that. Putting to sleep is, it seems to be like uh, a lot nicer. And sometimes it has some, um, purpose there. I think uh, when you're trying to break the news to a child or something, maybe you don't want to say that, oh, well, we're just going to kill your dog. That'd be really mean. You maybe using the term putting to sleep is, is a better way of saying that. So there's good elements and there's not so good elements to jargon, I think. And I, I've learned this too in working in academia and uh, being a philosopher and becoming more familiar with the terms and words that I'm teaching uh, you from this book, that sometimes it is helpful, sometimes it does. It's easier to convey certain concepts by learning new words, learning new concepts. Uh, but sometimes also on the other side, you can make something sound way more complicated than it needs to. Uh, there was a, I was trying to find a video, couldn't find it. I'll keep looking for it, but there's a great video where um, it's an older video. It is kind of an engineering joke where this video is trying to describe, you know, how to do something. And the words that they're using are so jargon filled that it sounds super complicated, but it's not. Uh, if I find the, the video, I'll post it, but uh, it's kind of a joke among engineers that, yeah, it seems like a lot of times that the that the jargon that they use ha is more complicated than it has to be some in some situations. Now, there's a difference between, and this is really important to learn, ambiguity and vagueness. Now, when we talk about ambiguity, <clears throat> and if somebody charges somebody with ambiguity, like it's really ambiguous. Like I don't understand what you're saying. What they should mean, I guess, is the phrase is ambiguous when it has more than one meaning. So they're using a term or a concept that can be interpreted more than one way. Now, vagueness, on the other hand, that's when you're using an unsettled range of the application for it. So what they mean by that is that they're using the term, but they didn't really define Buying, you know, what counts. So they're not comparing two different things. They just didn't clarify, well, wait a minute, what counts when you say it's cheap? For example, I say, no, it's really cheap. Well, what does that mean in dollars, right? Uh, is five bucks cheap? Is a hundred bucks cheap? What do you mean by cheap? Uh, ambiguity, on the other hand, is where I'm saying, oh, that's a high risk right? It's like, well, there's different meanings of the term risk. So oh, let me go back. So whole statements can be ambiguous in different ways, but there are two type of ways, and this is what I was alluding to before. Uh, semantic ambiguity, so the meaning of the word, so you're not sure what the, the word means in certain cases. Uh, that is opposed to syntactic ambiguity. That's from the structure of the word. Where is this word used? In what way is it used as a noun? Is it used as a verb? You know, that's going to be a different situation than uh, the semantics. So semantics, you can kind of work out maybe using a dictionary, right? Like we saw right now, you can take a term from the dictionary and then say, okay, well, which definition are you talking about? But Syntactic is not always clear. Is it a verb? Is it a noun? That's something that's not going to be maybe clarified real easy just by looking up the dictionary in some cases. So there's two examples from the book. 
Uh, one was from Trump and the other one was from Bernie Sanders uh, from the election we're referring to, uh, where Trump was saying, well, had called for the loosening of libel laws in America. And this is from the Washington Post. And so the publisher said, but there's standards like malice is required. Would you weaken that? Would you require less than malice for news organizations? And Trump responded, I would make it so that when someone writes incorrectly, yeah, I think I would get a little bit away from malice without having to get too totally away. Look, I have many, I, I think many of the stories about me are, are written badly. I don't know if malice, if it's malice because the people don't know me. And then the chair, how do you find incorrectly, right? So see where we're getting a semantic issue here is that, well, what do you mean by incorrect? That's, a, that's the concept problem. Syntactic, on the other hand, is where the structure, like I was saying, where it doesn't seem like the words in the right place, not the meaning of the word. So an example that uh, they used from Bernie Sanders was saying, I don't believe we quote, I don't believe we should uh, be punishing millions of people with outrageous levels of student debt. That short-sighted and a short-sighted path must end. Now, what does he mean? Or what, 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 in what sense is he talking about this? So, so when it says that uh, should have, we should uh, punish people who have outrageous levels of student debt, or is he saying that we should uh, not use outrageous levels of student debt as a punishment? So here, this, this punishment, right, um, in the way he said it, in the structure of it, uh, kind of leaves it uh, questioning. This is what I mean by going back to uh, the ambiguity. The word can be taken in different ways, but it's because of the location of the word, not the meaning of the word. So remember that semantic and syntactic differences. And so a genuine vagueness, when, when there's a genuine case of somebody being vague, uh, does not arise when people disagree. They're not disagreeing about the issue. Uh, rather, there's a there's an issue about what it's referring to. Uh, so tall, like I, I was kind of mentioning with some examples. What do you mean by tall? Is that six feet and above? Uh, does five nine you know, constitute as tall a city? So what's a city? Does a population have to be a certain size? Uh, does it when I say it's a city, does it have to have certain things that have museums? How do we turn from city to town? Things like that. And sometimes this is can be used again for on purpose. So I think a lot of these cases, uh, maybe we're not trying to be vague on purpose, you know, uh, just need some clarification. But sometimes you can use these uh, vague elements to, uh, to an ambiguity to use uh, for advertising. Um, my favorite example is all natural. When they term a product and you see in the store, it says all natural. What do you mean by all natural? I mean, in some sense, you can say that any, everything in the store is natural. If it comes from nature, then everything in the store is, comes from some element of the periodic table of elements, right? Uh, do they mean it's good? Do they mean it's healthy? So you see how all natural has all these uh, connotations. And like I said, there's there's certain elements where, you know, uh, these uh, this vagueness or this ambiguity uh, is helpful sometimes in in certain situations, uh, and it has a social um, purpose to get to help people get along with each other. Uh, the the example that I like from the book said, "Many thanks. I shall lose no time in reading it." Um, 
which is a really nice way of saying I'm not going to read it. <laughs> but it sounds a lot nicer as well. You know, thank you, but uh, no thank you, right? Uh, the other example here was from William Faulkner. He's a really famous author. And he writes uh, this book called The um, Light in August. And that could have a lot of different meanings if you read the book. So that might refer to uh, the setting of the story. It's summer in Mississippi. Uh, it might refer to light in August, the house fire that, it, that happened in the book or the light of revelation of, of seeing the truth, right? So all these things, um, these elements, uh, sometimes are really actually, this ambiguity is really helpful in literature. And I think on the other side, sometimes people take this ambiguity in the, in the wrong way as well. Uh, I think uh, religious scripture is, is interesting because people will interpret the same passage in a lot of different ways. And the way that uh, a lot of religious um, text is written is that it's kind of um, ambiguous in that you're so, but in a purposeful way, this is the thing of literature. So how does this story relate to me, right? But then it kind of, there's a double side to this, right? Where people can take it in all sorts of ways, even if you're reading the same thing. And that's something I think Plato, actually the famous philosopher Plato was really hesitant about when he wrote his philosophy is that when you write something down in text, you lose certain aspects to it as opposed to talking and speech. And one of those aspects is definitely tone. So how you say something will, will give a lot more meaning than simply just the words themselves. And that's why Plato was really reluctant to write his stuff down. It was plays, it was dialogue. It was supposed to be spoken. But writing it down, he knew people might take it different ways than he intended. Or they might read the character in different ways. I, I've had students who have different interpretations of Socrates, who's the main character that Plato always wrote about, that sometimes they feel like Socrates asking questions means he's a jerk. He's, he, he knows the answer, but he's hiding it. Uh, other people will read Socrates as, well, he's just curious and he's just asking and he wants to know it's not his fault that people don't know the answer. So same story, but the tone is, is very lost in, I think, the text. And slanting is, is yeah, when you're purposefully uh, doing that. Uh, you're carefully uh, selecting particular facts that make you sound maybe better or somebody else sound worse than, than the complete picture. So you're using something that happened, but you're, you're putting it in such a way where it, it's implying more than just the facts, more than just the cognitive part, right? Uh, there's an emotive part to it. A uh, reasoning of words where uh, they make little or no change in the context, yet they drain it of context. So, uh, some of my friends do this and notice, say, may or maybe, you know. So I, I they might offer um, advice to somebody to say, well, if you do this, this, and this, this will be really good, you know. Maybe, <laughs> you know. And so then it's like, well, wait a minute. Then what good was that advice if you're telling me at the end, maybe? And fine print disclaimers, <clears throat> right? So especially when you're signing contracts, you're signing a deal or something, they'll put that information. Uh, oh, by the way, this, you know, where this reinterpretation can be taken 
you know, in a lot of different ways. And it's not really that clear. Well, wait a minute, what are they offering? And evasion, and this was used in politics, and I thought this was an interesting case, uh, uh, especially with the debates going on, where you you're kind of want to avoid the whole issue. You don't want to address the issue at all. <laughs> and and I saw a lot of that in watching the debate uh, between Biden and Trump, uh, where people didn't want to answer the questions. Uh, famous. Uh, Example right now, what's going on right now, is where uh, Trump was asked, you know, if he would uh, publicly, um, <clears throat> I guess, uh, not uh, denounce, you know, white supremacy. And I noticed right away he he evaded the whole answer. He referred to a group called Proud Boys. Uh, who are a group of uh, citizens who have these particular ideals and ideas about, you know, the country, but he didn't actually answer the question. <laughs> he kind of avoided that. And Biden as well avoided some questions. So evasion of it is, is a technique that's used a lot. And you can see why it can be used to, um, undermine other people's rights and, and why it's used for people in power where you don't have to address maybe the difficult issues, you know, that may reflect poorly on you. So language is, is complicated. I think that's a takeaway from uh, this chapter is that it could be manipulated, it could be used for good, it could be used for bad. It, it's a tool, but it's a very complicated tool. And, and like I think any tool, uh, it could be used for good things, but it can also use to harm people and including yourself. I've seen people uh, maybe say things in such a way that maybe they didn't really mean it in that way, but the way they said it, how they said it, the structure, the semantics, the words they use maybe convey a different message from what they thought. And those who control the definitions, this is also a huge issue. So when, when an institution, a government, school, or something calls, um, uses a term, right? They say, well, this is success, or this is education, or um, this is freedom. How they define it really affects everything else. So are we, uh, in education, that's a really easy, easy example for me. When they say, talk about student success, how do they measure that? What do they mean by success? You know, and based on their definition, then they can say that teachers are either meeting that standard or not. Um, very relatable one is college manipulated language to hire adjunct faculty for less pay, right? So uh, adjunct means part-time. These are terms, again, that are used in such a way where it doesn't seem uh, with that negative, that emotive element to it. So when language is manipulated, it's not always so easy to see that. This is what you're saying about jargon and, and learning those words and seeing what they really mean. Um, asking about the syntax. These are things that you should do, especially uh, with the political debates going on in life in general. Ask these questions. Well, what do they mean when they say this term? Uh, a lot of cases I see, we, we tend to think we agree on what something means and then it turns out to be totally different. This means a lot of miscommunication. Framing effects are really interesting. They're, they go back to a lot of psychology where you describe similar phenomena but that influences our decisions. So if I put it in such a way that maybe you're more likely to I can persuade you to go in one way versus the other. Um, 
one that pop example that pops in my head is how we talk about uh, percentages. And there's been research about this in psychology. If I say something like one out of 10, um, that sometimes sounds better or worse than saying 10%. Really depends. So if I say, um, let's say for example, 75% uh, of doctors agree with this treatment, this comes back also to what we talked about sample size before. Say, so, well, wait a minute, how many doctors did you ask? You know, you're saying 75%. And say, well, I asked three doctors, three out of four, right? Which is correct. But you see how the way I framed it sounded much more convincing to say it's 75%, right? Instead of three out of four. That's, a, that's an example of a framing effect. And so this is where we bend the claims, right, in subtle ways so it makes it sound more convincing. Uh, sometimes we say something that is different from them we're referring to. And so this is where we use quotes and you notice in some of the PowerPoints I use quotes. Uh, quotations are used to distance oneself from particular claims. So when I say, well, this is success and I put quotes or people do air quotes, right? What they're doing there is they're, they're not uh, they're distancing themselves from that, that definition of success, right? So well, maybe they don't really agree with what that's referring to. So they'll put quotes around it to identify that well, I'm referring to something, but I'm not, I don't support that definition. And languages are interesting because they're, they evolve with time. They change, people change, um, cultures change. So I think um, a lot of good cases of this is you'll notice that uh, Spanish spoken in the border region is different from Spanish spoken in South America, which is different than Spanish spoken in Spain. And so different cultures, we call, call it Spanish, but there's hugely different elements to it. Uh, some words you can use in some languages, in, I'm sorry, in some regions, right? Even though it's supposed to be all Spanish, um, sometimes you're not allowed or it would be very uh, mean or disrespectful to use certain words in certain places versus others. And so we do have to pay attention to that. And I think the, the last message for the the chapter is that uh, since languages change, uh, since we're in charge of the languages, if we, if we speak a certain language, we're, we're involved in it, we determine what, how people use it, they, again, can be used in good ways and not so good ways that uh, it is somewhat our moral responsibility to be aware of that. So sexist language, um, attitudes against minorities and groups, you know, uh, easy example of this is I teach in another class. Uh, one author talked about how he was hired in a bank as a junior executive, which sounds really good. What he would say is like, well, it's really a bank teller. I'm a bank teller, but they, they gave me the title junior executive. And then he noticed the women at the bank were called bank tellers. And they were, that's their title. We said, well, essentially we're doing the same job, except I'm called junior executive and they're called bank tellers. And the difference there is that uh, he found out later is that junior executives can get um, promoted. Bank tellers don't get promoted, even though they start off doing the same job. So these kind of elements are, are important. Uh, the use of miss is a, another example. When you don't, you're not aware of the person's, uh, I guess, um, marriage status, whether they're married or not. You know, uh, we're not a, 
to not make the assumption one way or the other, um, miss uh, is usually used. Um, politically correct terminology, right? Uh, they change as well. Um, I think uh, a good example of this is uh, uh, the TV show that I'm watching is, is set in the 1940s during segregation in the United States. And what people will be identified as Negro in the show, right? And that was the term, the official term or whatever at the time. And later the community had uh, identified as calling themselves black. And then some people have identified as calling themselves African-American. And some people within that same community don't agree with that. So this is the hard part I think about the this sort of politically correct terminology. As language changes, what is okay and what is not okay changes as well. Um, so I think that's it for this chapter. Any following questions? Uh, no, it, it looks like it's uh, clear. The, of, I studied it more because of the presentation that we had. Um, 